All right, hello, and welcome to Module 7, Lesson 1. Um, we're going to have two lessons to really get this whole thing. Our ultimate goal will be to write and balance chemical equations. But before we can do that, we need to learn how to balance and name chemical compounds. And that's what we'll be learning today. So yesterday, if you were in class, um, or just in general, you should have your process page glued on to page 26 in your quarter three notebooks, page 26 with the nomenclature side up. And you are ready now. You're turning your notebooks to page 27. To get started, you can title this module or this lesson notes nomenclature and chemical formulas. Nomenclature and chemical formulas. So if you were doing this in class and you see a peer that's on the same screen as you, go ahead and hit pause, tap that peer, and discuss what you think these two images mean. So a reminder, go ahead and hit pause and discuss what you think these two images mean. All right. So what is this lesson all about? What is it? Le this lesson all about? This lesson is about chemical nomenclature. The backbone of chemistry comes from writing chemical equations. Um, and to write these chemical equations, you need three things. So to write a chemical equation, you need three things. You need to know how to determine a chemical formula. You need to know how to name ionic and covalent compounds and you need to learn how to write and balance chemical equations. We will be doing the balancing chemical equations portion um, in, a in a different lesson. Today is just about nomenclature and formulas. So we're gonna start with ionic bonding nomenclature. So you should have a heading at the top of your paper that says how to name an ionic compound. So this is one of your subheadings. Now, um, ionic compounds occur between a metal and a non-metal, or a cation and an anion. And ionic bonding is actually really simple to name. The cation is named first, and the anion is named second, always. So the thing with the positive charge is named first, and the thing with the negative charge is named second. So for review, the cation is what? Is the cation the metal in this situation, or the non-metal? Go ahead and hit pause and write your answer to that in the margin. Is the cation the metal or the non-metal? If you're coming back together after your pause and you've just hit play again, you should have written, if you had the right answer, that a metal is the cation. So we name the metal first and the non-metal second. Now here are the rules. A cation has the name of the element and an anion is replaced with the IDE ending. So let's think through some examples together, and I do want you to write these down. Let's say sodium and chlorine came together. We would name that sodium because the cation does not change, and then we would name it chloride. So instead of the INE ending of chlorine, it has a chloride ending. What about barium and oxygen? My non-metal is listed second, that's oxygen, and my metal is listed first, that's barium. So together we have barium oxide. Then the last one, let's say we have calcium bonding with sulfur. That would be calcium sulfide. And they never ever stray from these rules. It's that simple. So Again, you can do this with a partner if you see they're on the same slide, or you can just jot down the answers to this in the margins, but I do want to check this to see if we're doing this correctly if you are following along with team video. So go ahead and hit pause, practice these four names in your notes, four more examples, and then show me when you're done um, so that I can see if you did it correctly. Go ahead and hit pause and practice now. If you've just hit play again, we're going to go over the answers. So sodium and nitrogen bonded together, that would give me sodium nitride. Let's say I have strontium and oxygen. Strontium is on the left side of the periodic table, so I know that it's a metal. Oxygen is on the right, I know it's a non-metal, so this would be strontium oxide. Calcium and phosphorus would be calcium phosphide. 
Magnesium and fluorine would be magnesium fluoride. You want, as often as you can, for your nonmetal to have just a one-syllable stem and then the IDE ending. There are some, some um, variations to that rule, but not very many. Usually, you want to get it down to a two-syllable IDE word. All right, this is where this does get a little bit more difficult. So sometimes um, things will be bonded together that are called polyatomic ions. Now polyatomic ions are part of special bonds, are part of ionic bonds that have special rules. So with polyatomic ions, the whole thing is either your cation or your anion. So if you see three capitals letters next to each other, at least two of them probably are a polyatomic ion together because poly means many and atom, so this is a many atom ion. It's not just one. And you keep the name of the ion the same. So as an example, there's a compound that's NH4Cl. That has a capital N, a capital H, and a capital C. That's three capital letters, so I think there's probably a polyatomic ion in there somewhere. So let's see if I can find an NH4 um, or, a, or an H4Cl on this list. Let's see what we got. Is it going to be our cation or our anion? Now I'm reviewing this table. I see an NH4, and so that's name is ammonium. And then the CL is the second thing listed, so that's going to be chlorine. So that whole compound will be ammonium chloride. Um, let's say I have NaNO3. That's, again, capital letters. So if I have NO3 and I find it on this list, NO3 is nitrate and Na is sodium. So that's going to be sodium nitrate. So using the table in your process page, go ahead right now and try these three, writing them in your notes, but don't forget to hit pause. If you're coming back together and you've just hit play again, let's name these. NaNO2, that is sodium nitrite. Hydrogen sulfate is the second one. And then I have K is my cation and MnO4 is my polyatomic. So this one is potassium permanganate. Potassium permanganate. Give yourself a star on all of the ones that you did get right. Our next section of nomenclature is for covalent bonding. Covalent bonding. So Covalent bonding is named almost the same as ionic bonding, but it does have one change. Covalent bonding uses the subscripts to create a title. So these are Greek prefixes, mono, di, tri, tetra, penta, hexa, hepta, octa, nana, and deca. The small numbers you see on either side um, are called subscripts in a formula, and that helps create it. We do not put a prefix on the first atom if and only if there's one of it. So let's say I have a, for, a, a compound CO. So that there's CO has no subscripts, which means there's one of C and one of O. So that means I would have carbon monoxide but I don't call it monocarbon monoxide because if there's one in the first element, you don't put the mono, but you do for the second. Um, so CO2 is another example. C it has one, O has two, so that is carbon dioxide. Then if I have another example, P2O5, that's two of the P, so that's diphosphorus. And then five of the O, pentoxide. So it's almost the same as ionic bonding, but just with a twist with those prefixes added. So right now, go ahead and try these by hitting pause. If you've just unpaused and are ready to play again, BF3, there's one B in 3F, so that's boron trifluoride. H2O, there's two H's and one O, so that is dihydrogen monoxide. Then there is CH4, so there's one C and four H's, that is carbon 
tetrahydride. So you still keep the IDE for the second name. Now, in addition to having these names, these chemical names, we also have formulas. So we also like to write the formulas. And we do this because we're lazy. So scientists like to shorten things if we can. And writing covalent bonds formulas is actually really, really simple because you just write the element symbol from the name and then the prefix as your subscript. So we'll do a couple examples um, in your process page together for covalent formula. So I'll add that into the video. But all you need to know for that is you write the element symbol from the name on the periodic table and the number from the prefix as a subscript. You can also name ionic formulas. So you can also name ionic bonds. This one has a little bit more of a process. So it they don't give you the prefix from the name. This one you actually have to figure it out. So there are a few steps. So the steps to write ionic formulas are as follows. Number one, write out the element symbols given from the name. So if I'm writing sodium chloride, then I'm going to write Na for sodium and Cl for chlorine. And then you have to find the charges on each using the periodic table, which you find from the valence electrons. So that means you look at the group number. So group one has one valence electron, so they will lose one valence electron, so their charge is plus one. That's also a really good thing is to write the charges on your annotated periodic table, so you have that for our next platinum. Um, and then you switch the charges using the crisscross method. So step one, write out the elements given from the name. Step two, find the charges of those elements. Step three, switch them using the crisscross method. And step four, write them as subscripts. So again, we'll do a bunch of examples of that on the board. And the, this, the system is the same. The crisscross method is the same for polyatomic ions, um, but you have to use parentheses. So um, you have to keep the polyatomic ion whole, which is one of the most difficult parts. So it can be helpful to replace a polyatomic ion with the letter X until you finish crisscrossing. Um, and then you will use parentheses with them if you need to. Um, to get the smallest possible formula. And you always, always, always reduce. So again, we're going to do this whole process page together, and we can also um, do more examples of naming these things because it is slightly more difficult. So at this point, um, go ahead and flip to your process page. We're going to do these examples together.